Let us rise as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy. church morning so every february since i got sick i made it a practice to do a routine lab test sometimes i would do it on my birthday itself i don't know why but i tend to do that <laughs> two to three days of testing to see if i'm stable or if there are alarming numbers that i have to work on and i do this as a reflection because i don't want to be too relaxed I know I am okay physically, outwardly, but I don't want to take for granted this phase of not having side effects or symptoms. And I also just want to acknowledge how far God has sustained me. So every Feb, whenever my birthday is approaching, I would always get this feeling of regrets, of what ifs, um, but I also get more of the overwhelming feeling of thank God it was me. Thank God I got through the hard part early on. I was 24, so I had more chances of overcoming all those things. And thank God that I needed to be sick to, to see and know a different side of Him personally. And now I always hold on to a hope that He will get me through no matter what. He has strengthened my faith because we got through it together. He made sure I knew He was my strength. And through the hills and the valleys of this illness, I know that He was there all along in the background. And I pray this morning that you don't have to go through the same thing that I had to go through just to get to know Him deeper. While you're still in on your good days, while you're still healthy, you're still happy, get to know Him deeper. Intentionally want to yearn for, thirst for Him. And I just pray that you, you are able to put your hope on Him, on His promises. Collect all of this now so that when you go through your hills and valleys, you will also know who your living hope is, how how your relationship with God is and how who he is in every season of your life and that's just something I want to share this morning because every Feb I, I tend to do that and I'm just happy sometimes I'm happy sometimes I'm sad but mostly I'm happy because he had me go through all of that just so I could have a deeper relationship with him so let us sing our first song
I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Being still is an act of worship. It is an act of faith. When you are still amid struggles and calamities, you are communicating that God, I may not understand what is happening right now, but I trust you, and I know that you will work it out. So when you face challenges in life, remember this Bible verse and surrender your problems to God. Be encouraged to be still and know that that is still God because God is the same God in our valley and He is the same in our mountains. No matter what happens, be still because He is a living God. Victory is already won in Him.
Father, we thank and praise you as you gathered us once again and feel the comfort of your love, your mercy, and goodness upon us. Lord, we thank you for you have revealed yourself to us and we understand and accept you as our God the living and true God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and rise again for us to have hope that someday we will be together with you. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that comforts us each day as we walk through this world. We know we have met many changes, challenges. May you forgive us our sin, Lord, for we have sent love ourselves more than you, Lord, self-centered and selfish. Lord, forgive us for we have missed lots of time to study your words to be to learn more about you Lord Lord forgive us Lord as we come to worship and hear your words may you give us your wisdom and understanding may you be with Pastor Clarence to share your words toward us may you humble ourselves to accept your teaching lord may we keep it in our heart and someday we can do it to glorify your name lord we also pray for pastor dime who will be sharing your words to other church may you use him lord May you enlighten your words to the congregation and may help them, Lord. Lord, we also like to thank you for hearing our prayer. We know you have heard our prayer for healing. We also like to thank you, Lord, for we sometimes we add Sometimes we have met some uh, challenges in our daily lives. May you lead us to the right path of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for the blessing we have knowing that we will not want anything. We thank you, Lord, for knowing you and accept you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our speaker today may need no introduction. Our uh, yearly uh, guest speaker, let's welcome uh, Pastor Reverend Clarence. <laughs> Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Shalom. Let's all bow down in a word of prayer. Father, we give thee thanks for once, are in, once again gathering us together to praise you, to worship you. Lord, your servant is an unworthy sinner. He's a wretched sinner. Indeed, great are his sins, and yet greater is your love that you allowed your son, Christ Jesus, to die for him on the cross, to shed his blood that he may forgive him of his unrighteousness. And now you have even delivered your word to him that he may declare your word faithfully to your people. Anoint his lips right now. Prepare the hearts of the people that they may receive your word with gladness. We entrust to you the rest of the time. All this spring, Jesus most holy name. Amen. Our text for today is found in Genesis chapter 3. This is the famous uh, passage uh, where we find the fall of man. It's the beginning of the corruption of the world. It began with the sinning of Eve and Adam. Uh, I entitled this passage as the mistake that doomed the world, the mistake, quote-unquote, that doomed the world. Now, in preparing this, upon preparing this message, I encountered a, a philosophical and a trick question. Uh, let me ask you, who is a worse sinner, Eve and Adam or Hitler? Who's a worse sinner, Hitler or Eve and Adam. You see, it's so easy for us to say, of course it's Hitler. But again, let me just tell you right now, it's a trick question. And indeed, it's a philosophical question. You need to really think about it. Yes, Hitler may have killed 6 million Jews and um, made the lives of a lot of people all over the world miserable during that time. And maybe it still has its effect up to until this day. But Eve and Adam sinned and they doomed the whole humankind to hell. Okay? Their sin brought in corruption, not just to humankind, but to the rest of this physical world. The reason we have all this sickness in this world is because of their sin. So our passage for today, again, is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. Allow me to read. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord, Yahweh, God, had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat? from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. 
So, every time we study scripture, especially in the Old Testament, uh, I, we do Bible highlights, okay? You have a copy of um, the passage that is now highlighted. I always tell people to write away uh, and circle every time you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. All caps, Lord. Because that is the name Yahweh. And every time the author in the Old Testament would write this, they need to have cleansing ceremonies before they write that word. And so th there's a very specific reason why they would include it. Many of them would choose not to write it. Okay? Because it's so holy, uh, they don't want to write it. And they would use another word, Adonai, which is also translated as Lord. But it's not using the proper name of God, Yahweh. So every time you see this capital o, uh, L O R D Yahweh, it has its specific significance. Again, what book is this? Genesis. Who wrote this? Who wrote this? Moses. Okay, let's be clear about that. Moses is the author of the five, first five books, Pentateuch. Jesus himself said that. Because the liberals, the scholars, the seminary professors of liberal seminaries would tell you, no, it's not Moses. And when they declare that, they are calling Jesus a liar and it, the Bible is full of, of mistakes, of errors. Okay, again, it is very clear. Jesus said himself that the books of Moses, okay, it was written by Moses. So it was written by Moses when? When? During their time in the wilderness. During the 40 years in the wilderness before they enter Canaan, right? To whom is it basically first written? Who is the first audience? Who gets to read this first? The Israelites. That, was with, that, that were with Moses, right? So again, I want you to... Put that in, in your mind very clearly. When Moses was writing this, he had in mind these people, these hard-headed people who always complain and complain about God. He had in mind first and foremost that this applies to you. And there's a reason why he writes, Moses used the name Yahweh, Lord, here once. And it's written in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. It is to tell them that this Yahweh is a covenant keeping. He is faithful. Okay? The word, the name Yahweh is a covenant keeping. He is a faithful Lord. He is a very good and loving and faithful Lord. You cannot question that. God is omnipotent omnipotent, omniscient. He, he can just stay in heaven and not care for the people who sinned against him. But he chose to go down and communicate with these sinful people and even establish a covenant with them. A unilateral covenant. A unilateral contract. Meaning, I will bless you. Even though you continue to sin against me, eventually I will fulfill all my blessings to you. I will fulfill all my promises to you. And that is what Moses is telling these Israelites. This is a loving, faithful, covenant-keeping God you're, you are talking about. Okay? And Moses established that in verse 1. This God has only good intention for His people. Again, the idea Moses wanted these people to know. This God, Yahweh, has only all the best intention for you. Why is He trying to say that? Because if you continue to read on, Satan 
is in the business of making you doubt whether this God really loves you. Does He have all the best interest, the best, your best interest in His mind? Maybe He's keeping some things from us that is hindering us from, go, from growing and becoming a better person. That is the job of Satan. So again, this God has only the best good intentions for His people. He is a covenant-keeping God. He is a relational God. He keeps His relationship with His people. That includes, again, God only has good intentions for His people. That includes denying and refusing something to someone. A lot of times we question God whether he, is, he loves us. If you love me, you would give me this. And God doesn't give it to us. And we question whether this God is really good. Again, God knows what is best for us. And sometimes the best thing is to withhold things from us because He knows that whenever I give you these things, it would actually harm you, though you think it is what you need. Of course, everyone in the whole world would ask for money. Many, many, many billions of money, right? But we've seen money destroy the lives of people, right? Again, God has His reason why He doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want it to be answered. He withholds some things. He denies us. He refuses us something that would actually harm us. And again, it is with best intention. He has our best in uh, he has uh, our best interest in mind. Again, these are Israelites brought out of Egypt. Okay? God told Moses, bring my people out of Egypt. And so they, Moses led them out into the wilderness to enter Canaan. And God promised them from the onset, from the start, I will bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, who wants to go to Israel? I love to go. I, I haven't been to Israel. I love to go to Israel. Just imagine their scientific advancement. Desert, and yet they grow crops as big as, as, as possible, right? They are able to, they have good scientific minds. They have, basically, you tend to question, how can this be? It's, full, it's a land full of miracles. Why? God, from the onset, said, I'm bringing you to a land flowing with milk and honey. And they look at the land and say, what? It's a desert. In fact, for many centuries, uh, AD, no one wants it, right? Until the Israelites returned and developed the land. Again, you look at the land, it's dry, and yet God said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Basically, because God is the one who's going to bless it. So again, God from the onset, even before they set one foot out of Egypt, already told them, I'm bringing you to a land. I'm giving you a beautiful land. I will be there with you. I will bless you. Did they hold on to that promise? You see, since day one, they already complained. And to the point that they said, we'd rather go back to Egypt. We don't believe this God. We'd rather go back to Egypt and continue to be slaves rather than follow this God and all these troubles of not having food, not having water. In, con in constant danger of the desert land. So again, um, first we have to deal with the identity of the serpent. 
Now, there are liberal conspiracy theories, Christian liberals, who have all sorts of different interpretation on this serpent. Is he Satan? And there are uh, liberal scholars who somehow have an idea that Satan is different from Lucifer. So these are different princes of prince, prince uh, of, of hell. So Satan is one, Lucifer is another, Baal is another, Dagon is another, Beelzebub is another. Okay? But again, the Bible clearly tells us, okay, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So we're talking about one specific person. And that is Lucifer, that is Satan, that is the serpent. Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth with his angels with him. One third of the angels followed his rebellion against God. And therefore, they were sent down. They were fallen angels. They became demons. Some believe, again, the, the different lords of hell, which is Satan, Lucifer, Baal, Devil, Beelzebub, and all sorts. But some also believe that it is merely a typology, typology uh, uh, of, of or an office. They say, the Satan. Okay, so they don't have a specific person in mind. It's just a function. It's just, it's just an office, an evil entity. But again, it is very clear from the Bible that we're talking about a very specific person with evil intentions. Okay? So the snake... Uh, Verse 1, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord Yahweh, God, made, had made. Satan, being a supernatural spirit, possessed the body of the snake. Okay, some people believe that uh, Satan formed himself into a snake. I personally believe that he possessed the snake. Okay, a, a creature that God made. He possessed the snake. And so, after Adam and Eve sinned, God also punished the snake. So, you, when I first read this, I tell the question, why punish a snake? He was innocent. Na possess lang siya eh, right? Well, again, uh, God may have allowed punishment to the snake to crawl on their bellies for the rest of their life as a reminder for man of what happened in the fall. Uh, okay? So, yes, the snake may be innocent, but the reason God punished the snake to crawl on its uh, belly is for us, humankind, whenever we see a snake, we are reminded of the fall. What happened in the fall? Again, you would argue, but the snake is innocent. How can, how can the snake suffer for the sin of Adam and Eve? Now, let's understand. It's not just the snake who suffered. The whole world suffered. The whole world the Bible tells us the whole world is now groaning for redemption. Okay? Because of their sin, corruption entered the world. Now, let's talk about the temptation. There are things that we need to understand about tem the temptation. Verse 2, ah, sorry, verse 1. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat? from any of any tree in the garden. Now, first, temptation is always a rebellion against the person and the will of God. Okay? To question. The temptation is always to question and doubt the goodness of God. 
He, the serpent said, did God really say? Okay, first, it's to plant doubt. Okay, did God really say? Casting an idea that God is purposefully, knowingly withholding good things from us, restricting our potentials. So whenever we are tempted, we, are, we, wanted to do, we want to do this, but we know God somehow prohibits us from doing it. We are questioning whether is God really, does God really have the best intention for me? Is He withholding something good for me? To the young people, whenever you see your crush, okay, just last night, I was talking to a friend, a fellow church. Yung anak niya, binata, my girlfriend na. Okay? And I asked, how old is your son? 17 years old? 18 years old? Okay? And of course, we know uh, young people, right? Uh, they're so in love, they don't see a lot of things. Uh, and so, because we are falling in love, head over heels. We don't see a lot of things. And sometimes if our parents tell us, uh, maybe that's not for you, you, we think that our parents doesn't have our best intention in mind, our best interest in mind. And so that's what we do with God. Because we want something, we doubt His goodness. And so it is actually a rebellion. The key word here is you are rebelling against God. So when God commands us, do not equally yoke yourselves with unbelievers. Very clear. Do not even entertain an unbeliever. Okay? To be a spouse. And we question that. Especially if we see na okay naman, mayaman naman, mabait naman, Patalino naman, and then we begin to rebel against the command of God. Second, temptation is all. Uh, temptation always includes truth, but it is twisted, and lies are added to that truth. Again, temptation always includes truth. In fact, I would argue, temptation is always ninety percent truth or 99% truth, and 10 or 1% lies. Satan described here as a crafty and deceitful. Okay? He knows how to craft his words carefully so that it would just pass by you and you didn't notice what is the, what is the wrong thing in, he, in what he said. These are half-truths. My friends, 0.001% lie. So that means 99.999% truth is still a lie. The serpent said, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree, from any tree in the garden? Question Did God really? Did God command that you must not the fruit from a tree in the garden? Yes, right? What's the one word? What, what's, the, what's wrong with what he said? Any. So how many words were, is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Out of ten words, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. What's the only wrong word here is any. One word out of ten words. So nine words were true. One word is wrong. Any. Okay? And he crafted that carefully so that it would just pass by you to blur our vision. He sugarcoats the poison, and yet it is still a poison. Most of the time, the lie can only be, ah, most of the time, the lie is only obvious or known.
to the liar. Again, if I'm the one telling the lie, it is clear in my mind what the lie is. But many times, when we hear statements, sentences, statements from, from, from people who are lying, we cannot seem to distinguish where the lie, the lie is. And so this calls for discernment. You see, what the serpent said in verse 4, you will not certainly die. Question. Uh, uh, Satan said, you will certainly not die. When you eat it, you will not die. When Adam and Eve ate that, did they drop dead? No. So were, was, it, was there truth in what Satan said? Right? And so when they ate and they, they didn't drop dead, oh nga no, Satan was really telling the truth. But again, Satan knew that death is not only physical, it also involves spiritual. We'll talk about that more later. So again, not die. Satan knew. We also have to be careful with understanding the semantic. Semantic means the different meanings. So when Satan said, you will certainly not die, he has a different meaning on the death. Okay? So the semantics. We need to carefully understand the semantics and the fine prints. When we deal with a liar, you have to be very, very careful with the fine prints. Okay? When we're signing a contract, diba? we're very careful. Promotion, right? We want to know, oh, eat all you can for only 100 peso. Uh, you, you ask, what? What's the fine print? What's the catch? Meron palang maliit na nakastatement sa baba. You need to bring 10 people who pays <laughs> for the ano, regular price, right? Again, we have to be very careful with the semantics, the different meanings of that same word, and we need to be careful with the fine prints. This calls for discernment, and discernment comes from the Bible. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 tells us, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The problem in this world, it is already corrupted. We, it's full of lies. It's full of uh, evil things mixed in with the good things. And so we cannot distinguish anymore. But again, the Bible tells us solid food is for the mature. Who? By constant use. We constantly use the Bible. We use the Bible to, to look at the things in this world. And so we know what is right and what is wrong according to the Word of God. And we have trained ourselves to distinguish what is actually good and what is evil. Number three, temptation is always desirable. It always seems good. It always seems pleasing to us. It's appealing to our needs. In this case, the need for food. Okay? We need food. And our desire, it, uh, it talks about the, the eyes. And our improvement, wisdom. Verse uh, six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, okay, our needs, pleasing to the eye, our desires, and also desiring, desirable for gaining wisdom, improvements. Okay, again, is God withholding something from us that would further improve us? David Dean, my mentor, Professor David Dean in BSOP, told us back then that sin 
is always meeting our legitimate needs using illegitimate means. Again, it's legitimate needs. We, as human beings, we have legitimate needs. We, we, we want to be loved. You have the need to be loved, right? But how do we go about gaining that need for love? Do we go in an adulterous relationship that is meeting the need, legitimate needs, in an illegitimate way? And that is how we sin. Again, there's always truth in that. When you deal with a sinning person, we, when you deal with anybody, they would reason with you, eh, may kailangan na ko eh. Right? That's true. Yes. But how did you meet that need? Did you do it in an illegitimate way? Or did you follow God's way? So let's talk about the mistake, the sin. First, understand that Eve has innocence as she has no reason to believe that there is an evil entity who wish her harm in the garden. Again, they were innocent during that time. They were perfect. And the world is not corrupted. So every day, she, he deals with these animals very innocent, no problem. So he has, she has no idea that there is an evil entity in the garden right now who wishes her harm. So she has innocence during that time. She has never encountered evil or harm from the animal. But that doesn't excuse her from her mistake, from her sin. Why? Because God clearly told her what she was not supposed to do. Man has always a tendency to blame our sin to Satan. Okay? Uh, Satan, again, we have a tendency to blame everything to Satan. Kasi si Satan. We sin because of Satan. We sin because of Satan. But understand that Satan is but a finite being. He is not like God, omnipresent. Okay? He is not present everywhere. Satan can move very fast, but he cannot be here in the Philippines and in, in, in Hong Kong right now. Okay? In the same time. So, if I'm being tempted by Satan right now, my friend who is in Hong Kong is tempted not by Satan, <laughs> but by one of his demons or but again, we all, we're always too quick to put the blame on Satan and his armies, his demons. Understand that they are finite beings. Though I believe Satan and his demons has established and scattered their machineries, their influence in our environment throughout the ages. So in the Philippines, we are living in a very, very corrupt nation. Satan, I believe, has his time in the Philippines. I don't know when in the past. He has somehow put his machineries everywhere such that it would, all he needs to do is to press and the machine just works. And he can leave. And it's influencing people, our politicians, our world, uh, our people, common people. But the Bible reveals that sin is first our responsibility. Yes, we are living in a corrupt nation. You could always put the blame on the corrupt policemen, on the po corrupt system. Gusto kong magpakatino. And yet, this policeman wouldn't allow me. This system wouldn't allow me. But the Bible reveals to us that sin is first and foremost our responsibility. And thus, we are accountable. James chapter 1, verse 14, but each one is tempted when? By his own desire, not by Satan. The Bible is clear to point 
out that we sin because first and foremost, by our own evil desire, we are dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Okay, again, stop blaming Satan and his demons. Stop blaming people. Accept the responsibility that we have sinned against God. It's that simple. Our sin or our mistake may seem circumstantial. We may see ourselves many times as victims, but we must still face the simple fact that we didn't do as God commanded. Many times driving in the streets of Manila, okay, we get into accident, right? Maybe it's because you didn't follow the traffic rule, okay? And then you get into an accident, and then only to find out the person you had an accident with is under number coding. He was not supposed to be on the road. Okay? Now, you beat the red light and you met an accident and you found out that that person, first, he doesn't have a driver's license. Second, he was under the coding system. So he's not supposed to be in the road that time. And so it's so easy for us again to blame. Hindi ka pwede dito, di ba? You are not supposed to be out. Why are you? Kung wala ka lang dyan, you walang accident, wala kang lisensya, right? You don't have a license. So why are you driving? Kung hindi ka nag-drive, you walang accident. But then again, we don't want to face the idea that we beat the red line. Satan further said, ah, now, Eve reasoned out with the, with, with the serpent, with Satan. We must not touch it. What's the command of God? Do not eat. But Eve further added to that command. Okay? Now, this may be an added part. Not included in what God commanded, maybe by Adam. Adam must have added this to further protect Eve. When Adam was telling Eve, this is what God commanded us, not to eat from the tree. In fact, don't even go near it. Don't even touch it. To further put a barrier from the tree and Eve so that Eve would not fall into that sin. Second, Eve and Adam's sin may have been small and simple. But it doomed the whole human race, the whole creation. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 18, Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, which is the trespass of Adam and Eve, was the condemn condemnation of all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, the whole world were, was made sinners, so also the obedience of the one man, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. You see, when Adam and Eve sin. It, again, it seems like innocent. It's just eating the fruit. Understand that that sin symbolizes rebellion against the rule of God. You question that this God is good. And you say, maybe he's not that good. Maybe he doesn't have the best, my best interest in his mind. And so I am rebelling against God. I'm doing something that is against His will. And because of that, it's a simple sin. And yet corruption entered the whole world. Hitler persecuted, killed, tortured so many people. 6, 000, uh, 6 million Jews. 
And many, many more millions suffered during that time. And yet, it's nothing compared to the effect of the sin of Adam and Eve. It corrupted the whole world. All this sickness, COVID, eventually, if you really want to trace it, traces back to when Adam and Eve sinned. What does that tell us? Many times we may think that our sin is but small. But if you really understand, many times that small sin has a very big effect to the people around us. It causes pain to a lot of people. Number three, sin loves company. After Eve ate from the truth, from the fruit, what did she do? She gave some to her husband. Romans chapter 1, verse, 20, uh, verse 32. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, they also approve those who practice them. When we sin, we don't want to do it alone, right? Eventually, we want some approval. And so we entice people to do the same thing. We've all been in high school. Lahat tayo naging chitingero, right? And we, don't, we feel very bad kung tayo lang, right? And masaya tayo if we know all the classroom is cheating. We feel at peace. Uh, they've been telling this story, no? Whenever there's a very good, honest cop joins the police station, their police uh, force, no? He wants to be honest. He wants to make a difference in this corrupted world. What do they do in the station? Because all of them are corrupt, what do they do? They force that person to take corrupted money. Okay? Pag hindi mo kinuha yan, patay ka. And so again, we, try, we don't want to be alone. We sin loves company. And that's what Eve did. He gave some to Adam. What are the effects of sin? First, um, Satan said, you will surely not die. Again, we already talk about the semantics of the word die. In fact, God is true. He said, you will surely die. But they didn't drop dead right there and then, right? Again, that includes physical and spiritual death. Immediately, they had separate, spiritual separation from God. And so they are dead spiritually. Immediately, they are dead spiritually. Immediately, if, they, if that moment they ate, they are spiritually dead. And that moment, if they die, they immediately go to hell. Separation from God. But God in His graciousness continue to let them live physically. But again, physically, they immediately experience entropy. The degradation of things, of material things. So spiritually, first they became enemies with God. They lost the presence of God. In effect, that is the idea of hell. The, the, the loss of the presence of God. That's the worst thing in life, to lose the presence of God. Second, spirit. Physical death, immediately, not immediate, okay? Again, they did not drop dead that moment. Not immediate, sudden death for Adam and Eve, but the start of entropy, the, cor the start of corruption, degradation, degradation of their physical bodies. From that moment, they begin to experience sickness and they experience death. Also, the corruption and degradation of the world. The reason we have all these typhoons, these earthquakes, these volcanoes, these tidal waves, these sufferings, this COVID. 
is because of that physical degradation of the effect of their sin. Second, what is the effect of sin? They have now become like God, knowing good and evil. Now, this is a very um, controversial uh, idea. What does it mean that Adam and Eve suddenly is like God, knowing good and evil? Question, question. Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they were perfect, right? Do they know what is good and evil? Do they know what is good and evil? I believe they do. Okay. When Satan was tempting Eve, nagdebate pa sila, di ba? No. God said this, we cannot do this or we will surely die. So Eve knew that dying is something bad, wrong, right? Eating that fruit is wrong. So he knew, she knew what is good and what is evil. She, knew, she knows how to defend it. So what does it mean when it says, man has now become uh, knowing good from evil, good and evil. Again, Eve debated with Satan that eating the fruit was wrong and carries the consequences of death. So she knew what is good and evil. The idea of knowing good and evil here is that the, to be able to determine what is good and what is evil. So later, God said, man has now become like one of us. He's not talking with the angels. He's talking about the Trinity. He's talking to the Trinity. Man has now become like one of us, the Trinity, God, knowing good and evil, meaning they are now determining what is good and what is evil. Again, when they were perfect, Adam and Eve, God is God. He makes the rules. What is good? What is evil? Question, is being naked good or bad? Earlier on in this passage, it says they were naked and they felt no shame. So what is naked, being naked bad? No. That's how God created them. So it's good, right? But upon eating that fruit, suddenly man decides for himself what is good for him and what is evil. He dictates what is good and evil. That responsibility is supposed to be God's, but kegao ko lang, man suddenly took that responsibility from God. I want to determine what is good and evil. So their first act, their first action is to determine that being naked is bad. Again, God never said being naked was bad. But they decided being naked is bad, is evil. And therefore, they sew fig trees to cover themselves. How does that translate to our generation? Pwede bang bakla? Huh? It's a it's bakla. Can we be homosexuals? Again, man takes that and said, Pwede. We determine what is good and what is evil. So, pwedeng ikasal ang lalaki sa lalaki. Why? Because it's celebrating love. They call it good. That's why the Bible warns us. Be careful when people begin to say uh, evil is good and good is evil. So only God has, God has the only right to determine what is good and evil. And yet we took that from him. We wanted to be like God, to have that power to determine what is good and evil. Now, I want us to look at ourselves and see Adam and Eve in us. All, in our, all throughout in our lives, 
we live a sinful life. We wanted to determine what is good for us and what is evil. It is only when we encounter the truth of God that we begin to realize we should follow what God said as good and what is evil and not according to our ways. And so, application, each one of us is guilty of this. We wanted to be the God of our lives and we determine what is good and what is evil according to what is beneficial for us right now. Application, this is one of the greatest things we need to surrender back to God. Lord, I will not choose my own path. I will not determine for myself what is good for me and what is evil. I want you to tell me what is good and evil. Again, we see that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. And the Lord Yahweh God said, The man has now become like one of us, talking to the Trinity, knowing good and evil. Man usurped this authority, this responsibility of determining what is good and evil. Question. Ito ay chak, dinuguan mo eh. Sabi, good for food kasi. He saw the fruit, it was good for food. It, can we eat dinuguan? Ha? I love dinuguan. Eh, David din ke, gaw. <laughs> he shared the word of God to us and proved to us that the prohibition of eating blood was during the time of Noah and not during the time of Israel. And so it's en all encompassing for the whole world. It's not talking about ceremonial rules, ceremonial uncleanness. So you cannot use the, the axe principle of lowering of the sheet of animals and eat everything. You cannot do that because the command was given to Noah before all these prohibitions. Again, I love eating dinuguan, but because suddenly I realized the truth of God, I surrender. I surrender to God's will. I let Him determine what is good and what is evil. Because He has that authority, not me. We must learn to once again submit to God's will. Number three, what is the effect of sin? We try to cover our own sin. Adam and Eve sued fig trees. Does that help? No, right? It doesn't help. So we use our own way to solve our own problems. And we are doing that right now. People think that the way to solve our sin problem is to do more good works. The way to deal with our wrong relationship with God is to go to church and serve Him. But God has His own way. Now, before that, imagine one small simple sin is the cause, it's the spark of all suffering, all the suffering, extra pain, hardship, sickness in all history everywhere. What a disaster for everything to end here. But thank God it did not end there. God chose to love us and therefore God triumphed over our sin. God could have burned everything up and start all over again. But thank God He loved us. And immediately, immediately, He showed His love to Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, The Lord Yahweh, God, made garments of skin. Garments of skin. Adam and Eve chose to solve their problem by sowing fig, fig leaves, right? But God immediately made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. San galing yung skin? Animal. It's foreshadowing. An animal life that is killed 
for the skin. It's foreshadowing a substitutionary death over to cover our nakedness. Right? That's, the, that's, that's why we have the idea of the sacrificial lamb. A life must be killed. And that ultimate lamb is Jesus Christ. So again, it's foreshadowing the coming of Jesus Christ. The way, the only way God deals with our sin. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, And I will put an enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring, seed, singular, with hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Again, this is Genesis chapter 3 verse uh, 15 is what we call the Proto-Evangelion. It's the first gospel. It's the first hinting that God has a plan to save us. He said the seed of the woman, singular. It's not talking about Abel and Cain and Seth. No, it's talking about future one person, singular, seed of Eve. And that is Jesus Christ who will save us from our sins. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 and 10. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And since we now have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made Him, Jesus Christ, who had no sin. He was perfect. He made Jesus Christ to be sin for us so that in Him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So as a conclusion, a while ago, I started with asking, who is the worst sinner, Eve or Hitler? Again, it's a trick question. We do not need to answer that question. <laughs> okay? But one thing we need to answer, am I a, sin am I a sinner? And do not ever think that your, sin, your sins are but small and innocent. You're a victim. Again, understand our sin in the way we understand the effect of the sin of Adam and Eve. It affected the whole generation, the whole world. Our sin, our sins, is not small and innocent. It's affecting people. It's affecting the whole world to the point that God needed to send His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. Who is the worst sinner? It's not Eve. It's not Hitler. Again, it's useless to debate on this. Why? Because Paul already said he is the worst sinner. What? Paul, the Apostle Paul, is a worse sinner than Hitler? Let's follow the footstep of Paul and said, no, no, I am the worst sinner. If you really understand the seriousness of our sin, you would follow the footstep of Paul and said, I am the worst of sinner. Not Hitler, not Eve. I don't want to put the blame on anyone else. I am the worst sinner. That is why I need Jesus Christ to die for me. Greater is our sin. Ah, great is our sin. Great. But greater is the love of God. Greater is the forgiveness of God that He sent us, His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and to save us from our sin. Won't you now celebrate with me the love of God that though great is our sin, greater is His love and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give Thee thanks. That through your word, you reminded us the seriousness of our sins. 
that it has far-reaching effect. Help us not to look at it as a simple sin and that we are just victim of circumstances, but help us take that responsibility and to act on it. First, by believing in your Son, Christ Jesus, who have died for our sins and forgiven us of all our unrighteousness. Help us to correct the wrong things we have done and to begin to live our lives according to your will. Help us to surrender that authority, that responsibility to you of determining what is good and evil in our lives. We give thee thanks, all the spring, Jesus, most holy name. Amen. We now have our tithes and offerings. Do I call on Brother Edward and Sister Joy? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the blessings for the blessing today. The blessing of the spiritual feeding for the word of truth that you spoke to us in today's message. And we also thank you for how you have showered us blessings upon blessings. How you have been providing, sustaining our daily needs and the blessing of all blessings and how you have adopted us into your family out of your redemptive love for us through your son Jesus Christ and thank you for the chance for the another chance and privilege of participating in today's tithes and offerings as we again remind ourselves once more about your teachings about generosity, about the grace of giving, that in giving, it is our love, our love, our love for you that motivates us to give, that in giving, that we give as we purpose in our heart, not out of compulsion, and in giving, that we give faithfully, sacrificially, freely, willingly, because you love a cheerful giver. And we ask of you, O Lord, that you'll be the one to lead, direct, and guide this church in this stewarding, managing, and dispensing its resources in ways and means that your word, the message of your word, the gospel, will be shared, be continually shared to our family and our communities even in our workplace, in our school, in the marketplace, wherever we go, for the furtherance and advancement of your word and your kingdom, and so that good works will be produced only for your name, for the glory of your name, your honor and praise. This we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.
Okay, with no specific announcement, we'll just acknowledge your case. So we have new faces around. So let's acknowledge the presence of uh, here at the back. Okay, on this side. So we have, I think I was told that her name is Kathy. Yeah, Kathy, okay. Uh, she's a sister of Ellie, okay, Ellie, and a tag alone little girl. I asked the name, but she was so shy to tell me. <laughs> and also for, I think it's also my first time to see her. I, th uh, I think, uh, see, Leah, Leah, yeah, Leah, Leah, okay, it's, uh, she's a friend, okay. Okay, girlfriend, though, <laughs> Josh, okay, so welcome, okay. So with that, okay, so may I call again on Pastor Clarence, okay, to give us, no, our closing prayer and benediction. Shall we all stand and receive God's blessing? And now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus. For faithful is he who calls on you and he will bring it to pass. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all until the day of His coming. Amen and Amen. service ends here so we have the snacks at the back at the back okay to fellowship with each other. Have a blessing with you.